what's the vision for Horizon two, two or three years from now? Really, where are we going? Uh, and what's the big picture? So this starts with our mission, and this is really the focal point for my answer yesterday. Is uh, you know, rather than just repeating the exact mission as stated, we're building a peer-to-peer -peer ecosystem that empowers people and rewards contribution. All right, so that's it. Right, this this is the the basis for what we're doing, and this is what we should be excited about because in today's world where we see you know what's going on with this the current you know global issues and the pandemic, we're seeing borders erected everywhere. Uh, and we're seeing opportunities close off to billions of people. And, and this is what we're working against, right? We're doing this in a very uh, subtle way where we're creating a parallel ecosystem that you know, has endogenous opportunities just by virtue of the ecosystem itself, by virtue of the technology and just the empowerment that we're giving to people so that people have opportunity where they just don't have the same type of opportunities around the world. And this even in in the best world where there aren't, you know, borders and, and, you know, these artificial frictions, there are always natural frictions, uh, whether they're frictions on, you know, uh, heterogeneous education levels or just, you know, say, uh, you know, people lack opportunity to move to parts of the world that just have more economic opportunity and so forth. Uh, we're creating the system for them, right? That's, that's what we always have to keep in mind. So when we think a few years in advance, what are we trying to do? We need to make sure that what we're doing today reflects that vision. Um, so a, a little aside, a little, a little discussion here about decentralization, I think plays into this uh, quite nicely. Is I tweeted yesterday a great essay that um, by, by Hasib Qureshi Koresh, from Dragonfly Capital, and he read it on Unchained, which is a, a fantastic um, podcast uh, for, for our industry. And the, the point of the article is that decentralization should not, uh, in and of itself, is not a sufficient goal to make these systems successful, right? If we're only thinking decentralized for the sake of decentralization, we're thinking wrong. And what we're doing is probably not going to make sense. And we're probably not going to go anywhere long term, right? But in, in his world, in, in his VC world, he's seeing lots of projects saying, buy, buy my tokens because we're more decentralized than, than the other guys. Well, what does that mean? What, what's the point of it? Uh, and he laid out a great argument for when it makes sense. And I, I believe it strongly makes sense for us because it made sense specifically for Bitcoin. When Satoshi launched Bitcoin, he, you know, he, she, they did so in, uh, in a decentralized way for necessity because there were precursors to Bitcoin uh, attempts to create e-money, they were squashed by authorities, uh, and they were and they were squashed because they were centralized. You had a company, or you had individuals that were launching technologies that they hoped would would create decentralized money, and central authorities crushed them. Uh, whether or not they they outlawed them outright, or they you know crushed their banking relationships and cut them off from the, the financial system, or actually put people in prison. Right. And this was why Bitcoin was launched in a decentralized way and why Satoshi, we have no idea who Satoshi is today, um, because this was something that was not OK at the time. But now we take it for granted. So not every app should be decentralized. Not every business should be decentralized. Decentralization isn't some buzz term that we should all strive to for the sake of it. But when you want to be censorship resistant, like we do, because we're creating this peer to peer ecosystem, that we want to transcend the world and we want to give billions of people opportunity. We don't want it to be shut down unnecessarily because it's centralized. Um, so that's why we're pushing decentralized technologies. And you can see this in the tech stack that we're building and the fact that we're focusing so hard right now on, on our side chain technology is because we want to decentralize the architecture of our system so we, it can actually scale. And then if we want to go forward a couple of years, you know, let's go down that exercise. And, you know, think, where, where are we going to be? Let's, let's have some fun. Well, we, we want to decentralize other elements of our system that need to be censorship resistant. So not every app that's being built on blockchain needs to be decentralized. Um, but I think it's very important for our treasury pool to be decentralized. So the resources that flow into this ecosystem to power it, to grow it, to, you know, build, build it out, I think, very, I believe very strongly has to be decentralized. So we're, we're going to be working on... Uh, a, a voting system so the community from the, the bottom up participates it, as citizens in this ecosystem directly by voting um, on how resources should be allocated. So that's very important. We want to also decentralize our node tracking and payment system. We've been talking about that for a while. 
But then you'll also see tons of commercial blockchain use cases. And this was the whole point of launching uh, Horizon Labs and getting VC backing for Horizon Labs is not because VCs care about us as some idealistic ecosystem, but because they see the business use cases and the value that we're bringing specifically to businesses where blockchain makes sense. So it's like a parallel or an analog to decentralization. You don't do it for the sake of it. Just like businesses shouldn't be launching blockchain systems for the sake of it because blockchain is a sexy buzz term. They should be doing it only when it makes sense when you're solving a real use case for blockchain. And that's exactly what Horizon Labs is doing. And that's why we're focusing so so heavily on Zendu right now because it bridges that public-private blockchain world very elegantly. And we're bringing native data privacy tools and endogenous incentives for developers directly to the platform. And I think these are the things that give the ingredients for our platform to scale, and not just scale, but to go viral. Go viral in the sense that developers have a, a direct incentive because they participate in transaction revenue across side chains they launch. This is new and exciting and will be exciting once developers actually pay attention to what we're doing and realize that it, it's really taking things to the next level of what needs to be done in this industry. And then the data privacy tools are absolutely essential for getting real economic activity into blockchain. You know, we're, we're idealists here. We're innovators and first movers. We've been part of this for years, but not everyone feels the same. And not every business wants to put its private data on a public ledger. So that's why it's so important. And we're taking the time to do things like GingerLib, right? And to make other, other extensions of cryptographic libraries so that when developers launch applications and sidechains, they have native data privacy tools so that businesses can seamlessly transition into this world. And this is where we're going. So if we advance two or three years online, uh, here's where we're going. And of course, we're going to have things like very efficient tokenization, price stable assets, collateralized in Zen. We're already talking about that as a team, as a community. We need to figure out how it's, it's going to map to the current tech stack that we're doing. And if it doesn't elegantly map, we need to think about future modifications and, and go in that direction. But in two or three years' time, this is absolutely necessary. If we're going to compete, we have to be much more than a cryptocurrency. We have to make that cryptocurrency useful across a very coherent ecosystem. Um, and you should see big organic demand for Zen as staking collateral for our sidechains. Zen's going to be a transaction gas for our sidechain. So whenever a business wants to launch a sidechain and do business on one of our sidechains, they need Zen to, to process transactions. There's no way around that. Zen is, is the transaction gas that's used to incentivize every stakeholder within the value chain of our, of our ecosystem. Uh, <clears throat> what else? So there are other very interesting possibilities that we can do with the technology, and maybe we don't have to dive into details here, but uh, we can do things like... Um, do radical innovations on even our main chain. And I know Alberto has already started thinking about this. Uh, and I know Al Bene is probably salivating at some opportunities to be unleashed, you know, thinking about how can we entirely reimagine what is our main chain, right? If we, if we really scope it down to what needs to be on the main chain and think from an architectural elegance perspective, can we do things like recursive Starks on our, on our main chain, right? We're already getting really good at this technology with Zendu. Can we apply it on the main chain? Well, maybe. Maybe in two or three years' time, that's exactly what we can do. And if we can have a radical collapsing of the footprint that is our main chain, now it gets really interesting. And now we can really proliferate our blockchain all over the world to the, to the extent that you know, people in rural parts of you know, frontier markets could actually run a blockchain on their very limited mobile devices, right? This is the holy grail of what we're trying to do here. And we need to think radically about what we can do with our technology, with all with the ultimate goal of we're trying to change society for the better, right? We're trying to have a positive contribution to society that spans well beyond the world of technology, right? And, and everything that we're doing, all of the vision that we can have and the possibilities of applications of the technology and just the realistic acknowledgements that if we want to capture significant portions of real-world economic activity, we have to provide tool sets and incentives to make these types of things go viral. But at the end of the day, we're trying to make people's lives better all over the world where people don't have opportunity right now. So guys, I'll stop there. I, I've run a couple minutes over, but I wanted to really take the time to go a, a little bit deeper than my answer yesterday on the live stream. And, and thank you for whoever submitted that question. It was fantastic. <laughs>